But as much fun as all that was, I'm here to focus on our work examining remote telemetered ultrasound and th where this path took us regarding resuscitative self-care and where we need to go. And where we want to go is to focus on empowering point of care providers to function beyond their comfort zone, to provide just in time life saving diagnoses and especially life saving interventions, as it's interventions rather than just a diagnosis that you need to actually save a life in the pre hospital setting. But how we moved towards this goal was heavily influenced by events of the last two years. COVID-19, I know we're all friggin' sick of it. And the present global crisis in the Ukraine dwarfs this virus, but there's no question that it took over our world. So when COVID hit, we believed we had a paradigm that we felt had the potential for the world that was important to understand, and that was self-performed telemetered self-care. Despite all its chaos, COVID has been a tremendous impetus to telemedicine and remote healthcare delivery. A specific lining has been a tremendous interest in lung ultrasound and the diagnosis and management of COVID, which is literally exploding. Searching PubMed combining the terms COVID and lung ultrasound revealed nearly 17,000 hits on a topic that was unknown of two years ago. And multiple sources recommended for diagnosis, screening, triage, management, and follow up. So, let's, I'm going to explain how I think the requirements for COVID led to the rapid development of a newly, rap, newly described paradigm for self care and diagnosis, facilitated by simple but powerful telecommunications and portable ultrasound. The specific pathogenesis of COVID-19 lends itself very well to ultrasound-assisted diagnosis. The basic features of COVID are typically in the lung periphery. An early disease is an evolution from normal to a simple alveolar interstitial pattern of B lines or vertical lines that are plural based that is very, very well seen with ultrasound. So thus, there are numerous publications from friends around the world recommending using lung ultrasound to follow and stratify COVID-19. And we all know that practically, on a societal level, most cases are asymptomatic or mild. The so-called posse symptomatic cases. Well, this was noted very early on in the pandemic from an Italian hospital that was overwhelmed. But even in these trying circumstances, they recognized that the virus was not always dangerous, just very contagious. And they made a plea at this early junction from their overwhelmed, previously well-resourced hospital that, quote, pandemic solutions are required for the entire population not just for hospitals, and thus suggested that, quote, home care and mobile clinics will avoid unnecessary movements and release pressure from hospitals, and that early oxygen therapy, pulse oximeters, and nutrition can be delivered to the homes of the mildly ill, setting up a broad surveillance system with adequate isolation and leveraging of innovative telemedicine equipment. This inspired us to try to take their advice and go one step further. Through adding a diagnostic and screening technology, we all know has tremendous utility. Ultrasound is one of the most versatile and cost-effective medical tools that exist on our planet. It's for these reasons that the World Health Organization has stated Ultrasound access is a minimum global standard and one of the most important technologies developing countries need. And further, as my ever-growing personal collection shows, 
is ever more economical, portable, durable, and most importantly, internet connectable. So the question is, how do you provide ultrasound capabilities when you have an ultrasound present at the scene of a, an emergency, but no trained user? Well, potential options are telerobotic ultrasound, autonomous ultrasound with artificial intelligence, or remote telemetric guidance of a less experienced user, or remote telemetric ultrasound. Well, TMSB is focused on this last option, remote mentoring of the inexperienced but intelligent care providers to provide just-in-time guidance to generate the images that are remotely interpreted back by the remote expert. And I will argue that most of modern telemetric ultrasound science derives from the initial experience on board the International Space Station. With the success of our initial studies in parabolic flight that demonstrated the practicality of using ultrasound and weightlessness, NASA decided to include an ultrasound capability at a very early stage of the ISS noting that there was otherwise no x-ray, no CT, no MRI, just ultrasound. But again, that generated this problem of having an ultrasound, but nobody who knew how to use it. So my friends, Doug Hamilton, Ashot Sarkisian, and Scott Dolchowski reasoned, well, why not just get an expert to guide them using information technologies? And thus, with expert guidance from the ground, geologists and pilots were able to use ultrasound probes to make accurate diagnoses. Thus, a medical need essentially create, created the remote telemetric ultrasound of inexperienced users paradigm. And specifically to my knowledge, NASA also facilitated the first ever remote self-performed telemetric ultrasound in a manuscript from our group entitled FAST at Mach 20. Although sometimes astronauts were instructed to ultrasound each other, more often they were guided to image themselves as Pe Peggy Whitson is seen doing there. In my opinion, this is the ultimate empowerment and self-care where you diagnose yourself rather than relying on others. The rest is history, as remote telemetric ultrasound is now the backbone of space medicine. And point of care ultrasound has been shown to be useful in a myriad of situations when required by necessity. And that inexperienced caregivers, caregivers can be very accurately guided by remote experts. Ironically, my first studies looking at pneumothoraces with ultrasound were actually in weightlessness which led to a number of publications, primarily in aerospace medicine journals. But for the record, we began to wonder if long ultrasound might work on Earth too. And that led to the original EFAS paper in which we first used that terminology and correlated our findings with CT scan. Nearly 20 years ago, it was hard to publish this work. And it was called stupid more than once. But we went further. We also published an early article about on mountain sonography, which was published after a fight, albeit with an editorial, again, saying how stupid it was. Well, fast forward 20 years, I think the editorial is now irrelevant. But we did recognize the need to make the technology more portable and user friendly. Thus, TMSB has spent nearly the last 20 years trying to refine this technique to be a practical tool for Earth. In 2008, we reported on our fixed internet connections between the emergency room in Foothills in Calgary and the Banff Mineral Springs in the Rocky Mountains. The system worked well initially, but eventually became non-sustainable due to the need for mentors to respond to a console in the trauma center, which created delay, which even a little bit of which is intolerable in real trauma care. 
For the record, again, we also reviewed what we saw as the potential of portable ultrasound and air medical transport nearly 20 years ago. And we briefly flirted with viewing the images on board the helicopter. As far back as 2011, this allowed us to bring dying shocky patients directly to the OR, bypassing the emergency room. But more importantly, in 2010, we tethered an iPhone to a Sonosite 180 and started trying to make, trying to see how simple, practical, and ultra portable we could make remote telemetered ultrasound. And then over the next few years, we tried to mentor essentially anyone from anywhere using off the shelf technology, working with firefighters, ski patrollers, medics, even children. Our premise was that with internet connectivity, almost anyone can be assisted almost anywhere using technology you have in your pocket right now. Your smartphone. Honestly, is there anybody here who's not within reach of your smartphone? I doubt it. Except surgeons. Surgeons will not listen to anyone and are pretty well the only people on the planet who are too narcissistic to be mentored. But that's an aside. Another iteration of developing remote telemedicine involved networking teams of mentors with complementary skills. A few years ago, I needed to conduct a self-performed examination of my own of both, a Dr. Longus and Magnus, when I was in the Mercy ship in Togo. Well, I know a lot about a FAST exam, I know nothing about MSK imaging, but a remote network, including space medicine experts, musculoskeletal experts and NASA flight physicians guided me across the Atlantic to self-diagnose my own injuries. Ouch. So if we fast forward to March, 2020, when the pandemic was raging, we felt we had an obligation to get the word out that there existed a technique we felt could greatly assist in the global struggle to keep both the general public and healthcare workers safe while not overwhelming the medical system, such as was happening in Italy and New York at the time. We felt that the rationale for such a paradigm was that it would allow earlier detection of lung inflammation, especially in those developing the so-called happy hypoxia, in which they're developing severe COVID-19 pneumonia, but due to the particular pathophysiology of COVID, they are not particularly dyspneic. Although not commonly, some of these patients crash precipitously at home. And we felt with better home monitoring, this could be avoided. And from a public health perspective, such regular check-ins of lung health could safely keep most self-isolating patients at home, as well as prevent community transmission. It also completely protects the healthcare provider who is thus never exposed to the patient. And finally, we predicted that with regular examinations, you would provide psychological reassurance to the patient, sort of a good big brother watching over you. So to examine this paradigm further, we wanted to work with completely naive lay people without any ultrasound exposure to see if we could truly provide just-in-time guidance. We adopted the proposed Sodality protocol for a standardized COVID-19 lung exam, which examined 14 separate lung zones, including six on the back. We subsequently recruited 27 self-isolating volunteers. We had intended to administer a suite of COVID-19 screening maneuvers, including self-blood pressure measurement, self-measured oxygen saturation, and self-performed remote telemetered ultrasound. Can you get a bag with the tablet in it? Each and participant can watched a brief introductory video introducing the concept um, of self-ultrasound examination, but has no preceding practice. Can you get a bag with the technology involved a Phyllis Lumify ultrasound, an O2 sat monitor, a blood pressure cuff, all remotely controlled by me. All the devices were connected to the internet using a cellular phone 
which is actually more dependable compared to wireless networking, as wireless allows only one device, while cellular allowed us to use them all. As it was essential that our equipment not become a fomite and transmit COVID-19, it was all repeatedly sanitized, never touched without gloves, and sealed in multiple protective layers before being delivered to the participants as a sanitized package. For this particular cohort, Jess actually drove my colleague Jess actually drove over and dropped the package off on the doorstep. But we've also partnered separately with the Center for Innovation and Research into unmanned systems from the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology to publish initial studies on the drone delivery of a portable ultrasound capability followed by subsequent just-in-time uses. In this videos from Jess's computer screen 200 kilometers away, you see the drone landing, the ultrasound being recovered by a naive user, and that same user being guided to ultrasound themselves. But back to our study, for our cohort, we intended to measure open saturation on all of them. Cool. But the probe okay. broke early. We can confidently say, however, that this was a no brand that's extremely rate. easy to do cool. and should okay. be part of any COVID at home monitoring program. We did actually manage to, to self measure the blood pressure yeah, of every heart system, which was very easily done. Oh, I know. I watched the video. The most yeah. complicated part was navigating the sanitized layers for the blood pressure cuff. And if you just, I don't know what it's and and it's I will suggest, suggest that the logistics of protecting against COVID-19 are minor compared to the logistics of protecting against nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare if it actually comes to it. Pressures up and down all day long. Okay. So full details. Yeah, that's exact. That's so you've got the perfect spot. There's are lungs. in the recent manuscript. Right now there's lungs. But as an overview, we, out, we found that every participant is probably spleen. Could sorry for the volume. Could well image their anterior or side lung fields, and at the very least their posterior bases quite easily. Although not surprising as a trend, women were more flexible and adept at imaging their upper backs than men. There was also 100% capability to demonstrate the pleural interface clearly in the anterior lateral and posterior lung bases at a minimum. And I found it remarkable that when I spent some time teaching people what they were looking at at their own lungs in the anterior lung fields, that time was readily paid back as they actually knew what to look for in the subsequent areas, and I really had to guide them much less than I expected. To oh, be right objective, there. though, we then did just send blinded like images three. to three ultrasound experts who painstakingly reviewed every image and confirmed that the images were, yes, interpretable in 99.8% of reviews. And by having the well, numerical data on, on the anatomic performance of what could be self-imaged, we were able to calculate the performance of standard yeah, lung that's, imaging actually, that's, protocols that's all there. for numerous standard lung blue. ultrasound okay. examinations. Actually, I think go back towards that lock. And another technique I felt quite easy to teach was to show their participants their lung Go back, alternating with their liver or their lung alternating with their spleen right there. with respiration, okay, which is normal as a diaphragm ascends and descends with inspiration and expiration. And that actually confirms you're at the lung base, which is really considered the COVID hotspot, the most critical examination of any lung to look at, because that's where COVID usually shows up first. And that was quite easily done. Even these people had never held an ultrasound probe in their lives before. And unfortunately, one of our asymptomatic volunteers actually got COVID, but he was subsequently able 
to show us his lung exams on repeat examinations, and we were able to follow his recovery and ensure that he did not actually develop severe disease, fortunately. So we'll propose that TMSME has used lung ultrasound as an example of how to apply, apply a remotely mentored examination to a current and relevant health challenge. You know, maybe it's dumb, but I'm used to being told that by now, and I shrug my shoulders. But we personally think the future is infinite. So I would challenge every one of you to envision what you might want to know or how you might want to help a patient you care about, but you aren't physically there. And I hope a decade from now, this paradigm will be as accepted as the EFAST exam now is 20 years later. I'll skip actually that. But, but everything I told you will be irrelevant during disasters where connectivity or a mentor may not be available due to logistics, all the mentors are dead, or during disasters when communications typically fail, or during the challenge of long duration space exploration, where there'd be delays up to 20 minutes, even at the speed of light, or in modern peer versus peer conflicts, where cyber war typically means that the comms are out. Therefore, although TMSB has long championed remote telementored ultrasound, we also recognize the potential of video modeling. To find this behavior modeling involving demonstration of desired behaviors through watching actual visual representations. Although video modeling is ubiquitous in everyday life, such as learning how to change a tire, or a YouTube video on how to open a beer bottle with your teeth. And I will confirm though that Kate's father and I never needed YouTube to know how to open a beer bottle with our teeth. It is now ubiquitous. But we thus believe that we have conducted the world's first randomized comparisons of these techniques with an aim to empowering life-saving interventions that are autonomous for a requirement for internet connectivity. The subjects were actually Canadian Forces search and rescue technicians from 442 Squadron and Comox, to whom we are grateful. For the protocol, we looked at tourniquet application, wound packing, wound clamping, and chest tube insertion. All received an introductory lecture on the concept of study, but with no specific instructions on how to perform the procedure. In terms of their skills, Wound packing and tourniquet applications are considered in scope, while wound clamping was new, and inserting a chest tube will be considered completely out of scope. Thereafter, they were ran randomized to either remote mentoring or to be able to be allowed only just in time video modeling, and thereafter for wound packing. A third control group was added with just in, with no just in time training, as it was something they should already know. For the chest tubes, the required task was to place a tube thoracostomy within the pleural cavity of a standard simulator. We used standard ATLS training mannequins, but increased the fidelity by adding three extra chest wall layers corresponding of a skin and a pleura of tattoo skin, and a subcutaneous fat of felt. The wound packing simulator simulated an exsanguinating extremity wound. The task required packing it with standard gauze while maintaining continuous pressure with the non-packing hand, all of which the simulator measured, scored, and analyzed. Real-time telemetry was enabled by augmenting a standard SARTEC helmet with a commercial off-the-shelf headset, a wireless video camera that was streamed using standard technology to me, who viewed and communicated using GoToMeeting. Yeah, <coughs> For the video modeling, 
the SAR test wants standard video demonstrations of how to insert a chest tube or how to pack a wound immediately before being required to perform the task again. And it's important to count that for For the chest tube task, the primary outcomes were placement, which was considered successful in 100% of mentored, although two required corrective guidance during the mentoring process. Conversely, one of the video models SARTEX was unsuccessful. And in terms of safety, all telemetric SARTEX were safe, but one of the video medics was not and cut himself, so the task was stopped. And all the mentored tubes were secure, but the video mentored SARTEX whose tube was not, was considered insecure by definition. Interestingly, for the wound packing, the control group had half the success of both telemetered or video model groups, despite 100% um, expression that this was an easy thing to do. So, although this is preliminary work, we concluded that both remote telemetry and video modeling techniques have merit. And both techniques facilitate pre-hospital care providers to perform out of scope tasks and perform beyond their normal expectation. Video modeling involves less resources and infrastructure, but telemetering allows for corrective feedback. And it seems that either technique is better than none, even for tasks that are assumed to be routine because human beings by nature get complacent. So this brings us to the ultimate challenge. How to save someone who is critically injured, but not immediately unconscious. And in 2022, probably has a smartphone in their hand as they are dying. I don't have a statistic, but I suspect most dying in the world today have a smartphone in their hand or pocket. This previously unexplored topic is the subject of a review paper in press in the Journal of Military Veteran and Family Health. Essentially, it ties together many of the previously just disjointed themes we've explored over the years to try to bring life-saving equipment, technology, and expert guidance to the immediate aid of a dying remote victim. We hope that in the next couple of years to bring these concepts to reality for operational military space and even humanitarian medicine, but we need to find some funding to do this. A final concept concerns how to access the dying to provide care or deliver equipment to perform classic self care when they're in a danger zone. The classic model is a hero who runs in and then becomes a secondary casualty themselves. Thus, we are considering both robotic and drone-delivered healthcare options to save victims without further loss of life. We are fortunate enough to work with the Arapaho Sheriff's Office in Colorado to study the potential of bomb robots to perform extremity hemorrhage control on exsanguination simulators with all the bomb operators globe and we now suggest that all bomb robot operators globally to consider these skills for providing life-saving hemorrhage control in hot zones. Another aspect of this is working again with the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology to drone deliver hemorrhage control equipment. In this paradigm, a life-saving hemorrhage control package from the Stop the Bleed program is delivered right to an isolated victim. A critical component of the equipment is a cell phone stand in which the victim simply attaches their cell phone to so that they can use their hands to be guided to perform life-saving interventions on themselves. Because after that package has been dropped, the victim has to save their own life. 
there's no more cavalry coming. They either it either works or they die. That's reality. So that's what we want to take team must be in the near future. And they continue to try to refine how technology might save lives far before hospital. In my own final analysis, I believe it may be the concept of remote mentoring, first developed for ultrasound but broadened for a wide array of medical interactions, may be the greatest gift to humanity from space exploration. And that a clearinghouse of multidisciplinary specialists could support this. However, with informatics, this clearinghouse will not be in one place, such as NASA Mission Control, but could simply be a worldwide collaboration of experts willing to answer their smartphones. But I'll also say that remote medicine will be even bigger than remote mentoring. It will become a specialty of itself for which video modeling is one paradigm, remote telemetry is another, and there may be others involving autonomous decision support using precision image guided medicine or even technologies that we've not even thought about. And I believe in the big picture, we're all inching towards describing a bigger specialty that doesn't exist but one day will be bigger than pediatrics or obstetrics or even surgery. So I think we have hopefully started some of this work. I believe it will be younger, smarter um, investigators such as yourself that will carry this ball forward. And I hope I'm around to see some of the great work that's all accomplished together. And I applaud you for your efforts. And you know, especially for your, your interest and just it's exciting to see young people involved and excited about space again after such a hiatus. And I'll dare say that I hope my own daughters will be involved. But even if they're not, I thank them for the countless hours of child labor they had to endure as young children. So thank you for the honor of speaking with you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'd love to take questions. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. Um, anyone, if you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or send them in the chat, turn on your video, keep it off, whatever floats your boat. Go ahead, Dad. <laughs> I, I must prefer questions, you know, the spoken word um, than the chat if possible. I'm going to ask a question. And it doesn't have to, it has nothing to do with opening beer with your teeth. Um, question. Uh, are not recommended in weightlessness either. That's okay, <laughs> good. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, great presentation, by the way. That's the first time I've seen you present on that. Um, very interesting. Do you, th like all of us, a lot of us have uh, oximeter, oximeters? Yeah. Um, and uh, we have uh, thermometers, we have just basic care. And uh, you, it, you raised the, a good point of having an ultrasound available at home. Do you, do you foresee that as being something that we're going to have in the home within like the next five years because of all this? Um, absolutely. That some people already have them already. You know, lots of movie stars, whenever they get pregnant, they get an ultrasound. Um, I, I would amazing if they learn how to use them potentially a dangerous technology if you don't but i think we have always emphasized that the you know like uh, ultrasound is a great example of a paradigm where diagnosis is separate from interpretation um because even when you go to any ultrasound clinic around your block there is an ultrasound technologist who's, in, who's generating the images who realistically knows what they're seeing, but they're not allowed to tell you until somebody overreads it later. And so there is both a time and a distance factor. Um, the official responsibility for getting it right and not generating disinformation resides with the expert. This is exactly the same with this paradigm. If I'm 
following you a daily ultrasound and you have COVID, I want to make sure you're not getting sick. It's my responsibility to make sure that you generate the right images and that those, the quality is adequate. So you're part of the system, but the responsibility is still the person with the license. And, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm terrible at commercialization. I think that this this could this could be done five years ago. You know the time is now, and lung ultrasound is just one example. Um, it's used very, much more frequently in Europe to follow, uh, like COVID. COVID pneumonia is a shower of lines in a lung that should be nice and white, not have lines. It's because of fluid in the lungs from infection. But if you have, for instance, heart failure, where the lung fills with fluid you get the same kind of pattern. So there's a very much, you have to have some clinical context, but in Europe, they'll very much follow your lungs. Uh, are you taking your medications? Are you in heart failure? If your lungs are nice and clear and there's no B lines, you're, you're doing well. It's more accurate than chest X-ray. So you could very easily follow somebody with congestive heart failure to make sure they're taking their meds. Um, you can, you know, you could, uh, you can look at the inferior vena cava under the heart to see if somebody is fluid overloaded or fluid underloaded. It's, it's more of a skill to examine his heart directly to see how the heart is pumping. But I mean, every, I have my pet examples of what I do every day, and that's what I love to use ultrasound for. I think every medical specialist that has an interest in a part of the body We'll use ultrasound for that part of the body. And um, another theme is it is remarkable how technologically adept the average North American is, how they can use the internet, they can use their phone, they can download apps. And if, if they're willing to listen and follow directions, I'm constantly blown away at how good the average person is if they're willing to listen. And I, I was not joking about surgeons. We, I will not work with surgeons ever. They come in with this training their entire career that I'm an expert. I already know everything, even though they don't. And like, I, I, so I love, I love working with military medics. They, they, yes, sir, no, sir. And they'll do anything. So again, I went blah, but it's one of my favorite topics. Yeah. Yeah. So more than five years out, and it sounds like it sounds like uh, it, it could be a, a mechanism for follow up care, like you said. If someone has is suffering from congestive heart disease or has COVID, then you could give them that as a monitoring device, more specific to them. If you're if you're in constant contact with them, I get it. And same thing, you could very easily. I, I I do really think that the drone will deliver that there be no human contact for the next pandemic. It'll fly to your doorstep. Yeah, and, right. Excellent. And, and actually, and, and you know, maybe I rushed through a lot of stuff. We started off, you know, trying to bring tele ultrasound to the world to make trauma care better. We did, we fixed, we started with a fix. I don't know if it, I can't remember if it's T1 or T10, but this fixed internet connection between us and BAM. And Lily, everybody loved it for six months, but then they had to wait for me to drive into the, to the Emerge to get on the console. And it just, nobody's going to wait 10 minutes. It, it's, they need it now. It's got to be instantaneous. And that's when yeah. we started working with the cell phones. And we, we literally did realize that all the ultrasounding people in the world, ultrasound never saved the life. You still typically have to stick a tube in or drain something or, you know, put a finger somewhere. To start. You need to do something active. And that's where we're going now. And that's, that's where we hope to make a difference. Yeah, very good. Thanks. I just wanted to ask something really quickly. I watched a documentary a few months ago, but it was filmed a few years ago, and they talked about how the future of medicine is going to be telemedicine with doctors who basically Skype in on these robots and can go around in these remote hospitals from anywhere in the world, even though there might be nurses there, they can help with any sort of 
procedure. Do you foresee that happening more commonly and even in space too? Absolutely on Earth and absolutely in low Earth's orbit, um, not on the way to Mars because it's going to have to be autonomous. And that, that's why one of our avenues is the video modeling. And I think it's remarkable how it really is untouched in medicine versus everybody else in the world. Video models, you know, how do you do something? You get the YouTube video, but it just doesn't happen in medicine. And I think, um, I can't think of any other way to provide guidance on the way to Mars other than, you know, a library of what you need to do. You still have to know which, you know, which video to pick. And that's where there have to be some autonomous decision support. But if, if the decision support helps you with the diagnosis, then I can see real-time 3D printing, printing your simulator. You watch the video, you do it once in the simulator, and after that, you do your best on the person. And, you know, with, with, with a small group, you can have the bio, um, the bio characteristics all uploaded into the database so it would generate a simulator that's exactly like your patient accommodating for three for weightless weightless uh degeneration you know with the the catapia you know, all the de-adaptation that occurs with long weightlessness but so you can hopefully generate the ideal simulator to try it as many times as you can given the urgency of the situation but i I think it's going to be that that's the paradigm that I think we need to go to Mars. Yeah, and I'm kind of theorizing that they're going to have to send doctors <laughs> on the Mars mission too, because I'm not entirely sure <laughs> how well that would work. You know, that, that's always been a long going debate. And that's kind of why I did general surgery, because I always thought, you know, for the longest time, you can, even in low Earth orbit, you could tell a mentor um, knowledge. It's and or telemedicine can involve knowledge, skills are harder, but um, you know, I, I, I love that the base been going on for 50 years, and I think it will continue. And I look forward to your answers on it, Becky, and your colleagues. Well, I, I should go be on call then. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>